There we go. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, thank you all for tuning in. Uh, can you see my full screen? Okay. Uh, Not yet. Your screen sharing is paused. Resume sharing. Now do you see it? Oh. No. This did not work as planned. There Very we go. There we go, team. There it is, yes. Awesome. Okay, well, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk about my research. For bandwidth issues, I'm going to turn off my camera until the end when we ask some questions, hopefully. And so what I'm going to talk to you about today is my research, a little bit of health materials, and a little bit of neutron sources. Uh, to start with, I'm going to talk about my biophysics research. In particular, the importance of uh, membranes. And so you can think of the, uh, the cell membrane in biology similar to that of the, the frame of a car. It doesn't operate, doesn't work without it, uh, but it doesn't always get the same kind of attention that, that it would deserve whereas proteins are like the engine. And whenever somebody takes their car into the shop, it's always engine related kind of work. And so it gets far more attention, uh, although they're both equally important. And so the way my group approaches these, um, these membrane problems is we look for a, a good compromise between a complex system. So the cell membrane itself is extremely complex. We're talking about hundreds to thousands of different biomolecules incorporated into this, um, this biological structure. And so this is too complex to try to investigate uh, from a, a first principles type approach. There's just too many moving parts. You can go to the extreme though and have too simple of a system where you only have maybe one or two lipids and they're uniformly mixed. And this isn't overly representative either. And so what we look for is this compromise between complexity and uh, the ability to still tease out fundamental interactions uh, from our systems. And we primarily do this using neutron scattering or using neutrons to probe because these structures are too small to see uh, with a traditional optical microscope. And so one of the, the uh, systems of particular interest and where you get this nice compromise between complex and, and simple is looking at asymmetric membranes. And so we have asymmetric large unilamellar vesicles. And all this means is that we have these lipid sacs that the lipids themselves are organized in an asymmetric fashion. And there's been a lot of push for this in the last, well, it, it turns out the last two decades. But it wasn't until recently where a reproducible, uh, highly robust uh, method for producing these free-floating, stress-free uh, membranes was actually established. And that was initially published in 2016. And then a couple of years later, after groups got to work on this, the catalog of these asymmetric membranes were was actually populated with quite a few different types of membranes. Now, don't worry too, too much about the, the POPC or DMPC. These are just different codes for different lipids. The important thing is that we're beginning to build this, this library of complex membranes that you can do biophysical studies on. And so my group, when we try to study these biomembranes, we use small angle neutron scattering or SANS. And for anybody familiar with X-ray strategies, neutrons 
uh, to a first, very good first approximation can be treated the same way in the sense that um, the, the scattering and the data processing is, is similar. Where they differ comes in the form that X-rays interact with the electrons of an atom, neutrons interact with the nucleus. And so not just the fact that they, they interact with the nucleus, but they interact with different isotopes in different ways. And so we can play games by substituting hydrogens in our biological systems with deuteriums. And this provides a internal contrast without having to introduce a bulky or disruptive chemical probe. And so there's, there's been a growing effort using SANS to study these asymmetric uh, vesicles. And what we have here are two SANS curves, one in black for an asymmetric bilayer and for a symmetric bilayer in red. And so this is idealized experimental data. And so you can see that there's a characteristic liftoff in the, in the SANS data if the system is asymmetric. And this stems from the fact that you lose your centrosymmetry in the, in the structure. And so you can't simply treat the data with a cosine, but you actually have to treat it with both a sine and a cosine. And so this is how we get these nice uh, characteristic liftoffs. And so one thing my group likes to, wants to do is understand not only the structure, but how do these lipids move within the bilayer? And one of the movements that SANS is particularly well suited to measure is that of lipid flip-flop. It's also known as transverse lipid diffusion or lipid translocation. So these terms, um, depending on what mechanism you believe, you, these terms will be uh, used throughout literature. But effectively what we're wanting to measure and what we're interested in is the rate that a lipid goes from this leaflet to this leaflet of the bilayer. And so that's what I'm going to talk to you about now. And so, because I broke this talk into two sections, I'll give my acknowledgements for this uh, up front. And so the bulk of this work has been done by uh, Michael Nguyen. He's a senior PhD student in my lab uh, with support from both my other senior PhD student, Mitch DePasquale, and a former master's student of mine, Brett Rickard. And of course, we use neutrons. We have to go to external facilities to access these tool. So of course, have to acknowledge Oak Ridge National Labs and their spallation neutron source, as well as NIST and their Center for Neutrons Research, who generously provided the neutron time to take these measurements. So here's some real experimental data. And so we have a system where I have one lipid, we'll call it DMPC, and it's chain deuterated. So all the hydrogens in the fatty acid chain of the lipid are deuterium. And then we have a other lipid, call it POPC, and their chains are hydrogenated with a little deuterium in the head group. And so you can see how we're introducing a, a large amount of contrast into the system by substituting deuterium for hydrogen. And so this is what the data looks like for a symmetric bilayer. And we call it a scrambled bilayer because when you, when you generate asymmetry or when a cell generates asymmetry, it costs energy and it's not its equilibrium state. So the, the membrane wants to 
drive to a, a symmetric or scrambled form. And so this is where using the term scrambled arrives from. Now, if we're able to generate an asymmetric vesicle, an asymmetric bilayer, sure enough, we get this characteristic liftoff that comes with it. So this is a, a great initial test. Can we actually see the asymmetry of the bilayer experimentally? Because as I showed you before, theoretically, we should be able to end the theoretical curves and our actual experimental data look, um, look very similar. So this is an excellent sign that we're moving in the right direction. So let's, instead of taking this static picture of a asymmetric bilayer, let's monitor it over time. No perturbations to the system, just fix it at a, a, a fixed temperature. So say 37 degrees Celsius, which is uh, our body temperature. And just monitor the, the SANS curve and see how it changes with time. Well, we did this. And you can see in the, the plot, we have our scrambled curve which we artificially scrambled. And then we have our asymmetric bilayer at time zero in black, 11 hours later in red, and tw 28 hours later in the, the pink, and then purple is 65 or 68 hours later. So this is, this is a very, very long time in the scale of um, a neutron experiment. And we get very, very little change in the degree of asymmetry of the system. So this experiment here isn't a very good demonstration of the fact of measuring the kinetics because we haven't been able to see anything change over the course of the whole measurement. And so the next step is, are we able to somehow speed this process up in order to monitor it using neutrons? And so, what we did was incorporated a pore forming peptide called gramicidin. Now, gramicidin is an antimicrobial peptide, and its me mechanism of action is it forms these pores or channels in the membrane and cause the cell to leak out its um, internal components. And so it had been shown using other strategies that gramicidin can actually induce flip-flop. And so are we able to reproduce this kind of observation using SANS? Well, it turns out that yes, we are. So over a similar time range in an asymmetric vesicle containing gramicidin, we can see we get this nice systematic change over time as the bilayer scrambles. And to make it a little more obvious, our gramicidin free versus gramicidin, we can plot the change in intensity, a normalized change in intensity as a function of time and extract out a rate constant, but also the half-life of the asymmetry. And you can, it's quite obvious that the gramicidin decreases the lifetime of that, uh, that asymmetry significantly. So this is great. We've demonstrated that we can use SANS to monitor the lipid flip-flop. So now let's, let's do something with it. Let's, let's look at uh, some more, let's look at some systems where we can ask scientific questions. So one question that I was particularly interested in is, what are the modes of actions of antimicrobial peptides, but also how does this pore structure of the peptide influence the flip-flop rate? So you can have a barrel stave pore where the protein lines the whole interior of the pore and no lipids um, are needed to sh shield the hydrocarbon chains from water. However, you can have 
troidal pores like we have with melatonin, which melatonin is, is actually bee venom or in bee venom, I should say. And it forms pores where it's a combination of the lipids and the protein that lines the interior of the pore. And so you can, these are two very different structures. And one could postulate that the rate of flip-flop or the rate of migration of a lipid from one leaflet to the other would differ given these two pore systems. Now, as a way of uh, control for these experiments, we introduce a peptide called FLIP, which is a pH low insertion peptide. Now, this, this peptide is, is used for different cancer treatments because at high pHs, it sits on the surface of the cell membrane, but at low pHs, it actually inserts itself. And this is useful in cancer treatment because many cancer tissues are acidic or have low pHs. And so using the same molecule, we're able to test two different uh, um, two different environments for the peptide and how it will impact lipid flip-flop. So this is a data dense slide, but there's not a whole lot to show you. So we have our flip at a low pH, an intermediate pH, and a high pH. And so these should all exist with the protein in, in different states within the membrane. But if you look at the data, we have our protein-free sample and our very first measurement in the presence of the protein already matches the scrambled. And this is true for all the different pHs um, FLIP was measured at. But not only for FLIP, this is also the case for the melatonin and allomethacin. So these two pore, different pore forming peptides, they also show that before we could even take the measurement, we had lost asymmetry. Well, holy smokes. We were able to demonstrate this, this measurement works with gramocidin. Why do we have a difference in behavior? Well, it turns out that to handle gramocidin, you have to pre-incorporate it into the membrane before the asymmetry is actually generated. And so there is no insertion step in the gramocidin measurements, whereas all the other peptides are added after the preparation. And so there has to be two steps. There has to be the addition to the solution, and then that protein has to dock to the surface. And if it's going to insert, it then has to insert. And so based on our data, the bilayer gets scrambled in this docking slash insertion step of the process. And so this teaches us a number of things. So it was a bit of a bust for the, the experiment we were aiming for. We were hoping to see all these different um, scattering curves change with time and extract rate constants, et cetera, but we can't because something is being disruptive when the protein or the peptide interacts with the membrane. However, this is quite an important observation because lots of researchers want to study different peptides and proteins in an asymmetric membrane. And so what we've demonstrated is you have to be very, very careful on how you introduce these peptides to the system because they can ruin your membrane and you won't actually be investigating what you're uh, intending to investigate. So lessons learned and we have to move on. And so the interest in how do these different pore structures impact lipid flip-flop still was there. And so we had to come up with another experimental strategy to do this. And so once again, we go back to SANS, but is there a way that we can use 
symmetric vesicles where the docking and insertion of peptides should not alter the degree of asymmetry. And so one thing you can do with neutrons, like I said, it has sensitivity to different isotopes. So you can change the amount of deuterium on the lipids, but you can also change the amount of deuterium in the water. You can do this in such a way that you actually make different components of your system invisible to neutrons. And so in this video here, what we have is a, a silicon ball that has the same refractive index as water. And so being it has the same refractive index, there's no contrast. And this is why we cannot see it when it's in the solution. So the, we can take this strategy or analogy and apply it to neutrons where we can adjust the scattering length of the water and our system in such a way that we can make different parts invisible. And so this is exactly what we did. So if we have two populations of vesicles, they'll both be symmetric. So this is the, the view of the bilayer itself. So any changes on the bilayer or the vesicles before they're mixed will not show up in the experiment. So flip-flop can be occurring constantly, but we won't detect it because there's no contrast. Now we can design our water in such a way that when the systems are completely mixed with each other, where you have black and white completely mixed on both leaflets, that matches the water. And so what this does to your data is when you're in a high contrast state, like over here, you get a signal, you get neutrons scattering. However, when you get to the low contrast system where everything should be matched out, you can see that the signal all but disappears. And so by using this strategy, we can actually monitor two events. We monitor the exchange of lipids between the two ves vesicles. And we also monitor the lipid flip-flop. And it's the lipid flip-flop that we're most interested in. So first, we have to demonstrate that this will work. Now, this was not pioneered by us um, in 2007. Uh, Nakano and co-workers, they demonstrated that this, this strategy could be used for monitoring lipid motions. And so you have to give credit where credit's due. And they also did the heavy lifting. They worked out um, the, the theory and the analysis to uh, treat this data. Nevertheless, we have to start doing our, our experiments and our control samples. And so the way we introduce these lipids to this or these proteins to the system is through the using the short chained alcohol methanol. So these proteins dissolve in methanol, we add it to the water, it's miscible, they, they can get introduced to the, the membrane. And so when doing the control of just methanol only, we observed a, a very significant change in the, the flip-flop and exchange of of lipids just in the presence of the alcohol. But when you look at the structure of the bilayer in the absence and presence of the methanol, there's no change in the structure. So this is something that uh, could be largely overlooked if all you were looking at was the system's structure. But the change, and most drastically in flip-flop, is the changes in dynamics of the lipids. So this alcohol is promoting lipid flip-flop. Now, just by running the control, we've learned something very valuable, not just as biophysicists, but biochemists and biologists in general. We have to be very conscious and careful what solvents we use and introduce to our, our, uh, our cells or our tissues when we're doing experiments in the lab. Because as you can see, even in small amounts, these different solvents can have a, a very large impact 
on how the, the lipids in the membranes behave. So once we've est we establish, okay, we have to be conscious of what the methanol is doing to the system. Now let's move on and take a look at what's happening to the system in these pore forming peptides, whether it be alamethacin, melatonin. Um, and what you can see is systematically with the uh, addition of more and more peptide, you can see that the flip-flop or the, the rate at which these vesicles scramble increases. Okay, more peptide, more lipid motion. That, that seems reasonable. Now, you can also do the temperature dependence because what the temperature dependence does is allows us to uh, apply Arrhenius theory to extract some thermodynamics of these, these processes. And the reason we choose 1 to 40 as the, the uh, lipid to peptide ratio or the peptide to lipid ratio mm -hmm. is because it's been demonstrated in the past and generally accepted that the uh, that these form stable pores at that P to L ratio. And, and this is what we were looking for is, is stable pores. And so when you look at the exchange of the system versus our methanol standard curve, you can see that you know, there's, there's minor perturbation to alamethacin, but the melatonin seems relatively unperturbed until we get to the very high P to L ratio. But what we're more interested in is the flip-flop. And you can see that the flip-flop or the half-life of the asymmetry is drastically reduced in the presence of these uh, peptides until you get to this high P to L ratio. And then it's hard to distinguish. Um, the impact of the, the peptide versus the methanol. But nevertheless, it, uh, there, is, there is a somewhat of an acceleration for the alamethacin. And so if we do our, use our temperature dependence and plot the natural log of the rate constants versus one over temperature, we can get a straight line. And from that straight line, we can extract the activation energy. And if you apply some transition state theory to the system, you're able to extract the uh, transition state enthalpy, entropy, and ultimately the, the free energy. And so for the flip-flop, what you can see is that the peptides have a huge impact on the, the activation energy and the enthalpy and entropy of the process. And so this, this tells us that clearly the peptide is the driving force, but despite there being a change in in, or a difference in pore structure, there doesn't seem to be uh, an over a, a significant difference in the thermodynamics, which would suggest that the pore structure isn't necessarily the driving force for the lipid flip flop. And so, with this part of the talk. I hope I've convinced you that um, neutrons can be used to, to study the, the lipid flip-flop or the transverse um, diffusion of, of lipids, whether it be um, in the presence or absence of peptide, that 
as, as scientists that work with biological systems, we need to be mindful of the binding and insertion of different, uh, different molecules into the membrane and the implications it could have. And that poor forming peptides are promoters of lipid flip-flop. And so this is a possible mechanism of how these antimicrobial peptides work. Not just possible mechanism, but it's uh, the act of forming the pores uh, is definitely one of the contributing factors, but the loss of asymmetry could be another. And, and we have to be conscious that the methanol is also a promoter of, of lipid motions. And so we do have to be, be mindful of this. Okay, so we're going to change gears now. And instead of talking about neutrons impact on, on membranes per se, I'd like to talk to you now about some broader impacts of neutrons and what we're trying to do to uh, gain some new neutron sources in Canada. And so neutrons have had major impacts on, on priority regions or priority areas of the government. So clean energy or clean environment. Neutrons, because of their properties, are able to be used in industry to uh, improve materials uh, specifically metals, um, both in how they're uh, manufactured, but also the recycling of uh, materials in the manufacturing process. And so, for example, the hydroelectric dam, Quebec Hydro, saved uh, millions and millions of dollars because they were able to assess the, uh, the stresses and lifetimes of their turbines using, um, using neutrons. Uh, Bombardier was able to rework how they um, manufactured, reducing their waste, ultimately saving them money. We were able to assess the, uh, the structure of aging infrastructure in, in our, our military using neutrons. And because of the, the isotopic properties or interactions of neutrons, you can actually watch water being uptaken in novel types of crops or drought resistant crops. And so they have all these applications outside of what I, I talked to you about previously. And this is because they have, a neutron has a neutral charge and because they have a neutral charge and they don't interact with the electron clouds, they're highly penetrating compared to their X-ray counterparts. They're sensitive to light isotopes. And so X-ray, it's very difficult studying the location of hydrogen, whereas with neutrons, you, hydrogen lights up. Neutrons have a magnetic moment and so they can be used to probe um, novel magnetic materials and, and quantum materials. You know, here is an example of, of just the true penetrating power of neutrons. So this is a lead container filled with a flower. And you can see that the neutrons penetrate right through the lead. And you can see the flower. And so the applications and implications of this are huge in terms of archaeology and forensic science and so on, where you can look inside of uh, containers without having to open them. So where do we get our neutrons from? Well, there's a few different sources. So you can have a fission reactor. And so this is typically what comes to people's mind when they talk about the, uh, the nuclear industry. You have uranium plus a neutron and it uh, gives you more neutrons. These are expensive. They're on the order of you know a billion dollars plus the expense of running them. They have what you call a spallation source. Now this is what they have in Oak Ridge National Labs. And this is using a high energy proton on a heavy metal target at extremely high energies. 
And these are quite expensive as well, on the order of one to two billion dollars to build. And then there's this stripping reaction where it's a proton, a low energy proton, on a relatively light element, whether it's beryllium or lithium. And these are, like I said, a low energy proton, so you has a small footprint. You don't need a vast accelerator infrastructure in order to, to produce the, the proton. So relatively speaking, it's inexpensive. It's on the order of 10 to $100 million rather than billions of dollars. They're very, they're very modular, so you can uniquely design them to suit the needs of the research community at the time. And we call these compact accelerator neutron sources. And so what we're working to do is actually build a compact accelerator neutron source prototype here at the University of Windsor. And it's, I've been internally using the Windsor Center for Neutron Research, or the WinCNR, as the, uh, the name of the facility. But this isn't a, an isolated, this isn't an isolated endeavor. This is um, a University of Windsor led with a very close connection to Triumph in BC initiative. And we have 40 researchers from 19 institutions spanning four countries that are trying to work on this problem together. And so this prototype facility that we're aiming to build at the University of Windsor, well, we want to construct world-leading prototype. Well, how can you have a world-leading, but yet it's still just a prototype? Well, this is, this is a, a relatively underdeveloped technology at this point. And so we have the potential to put together a, a instrument or machine um, that will allow competitive world-leading research, even though it is a, a prototype. And so the, the three primary research cases that um, we'd like to use using this or do using this technology is small angle neutron scattering. As you've seen from the first part of my talk, this is a, a technique that is quite important to my research. Neutron imaging. And so that picture of the flower in the lead flask. This is neutron imaging. And so this can be applied to very various uh, areas. And then a cancer therapy that is um, underdeveloped in North America. And there is only, I believe, two clinically approved facilities um, worldwide. And so it, we have the chance to enter into this area um, right at the ground stage. And also th this facility will be able to support uh, medical isotopes to the, the local hospital. And so we have our, our prototype, but there's, there's various aspects that need to be addressed and um, research to be done at each stage. So the accelerator and target system, well, there needs to be work done and research done on what's the best accelerator to do this? What's the target geometry? What's the target material? And so we have graduate students and postdocs right now working on this, um, this very problem. What does our BNCT facility look like? What, does, what are the requirements for it? Um, producing the medical isotopes. Well, this is, um, this is more of a service to our community, but it'll still take um, students and, and researchers to, to complete. And then the materials research that's made possible through the, the beam lines. And so Triumph, in collaboration with us, um, they're really working on the, the accelerator target moderator. And so what is the, the accelerator requirements in order to produce this prototype? What are the target materials? And it's not just what material will give you the most neutrons, but what material can handle the energies of protons without melting or some, some fo other form of catastrophic failure? How do you get those neutrons out after they're, 
produced. All of these different problems um, remain even if you have a large amount of neutrons produced at the target. Our materials research. So we hope to have a SANS instrument that we can study different biological systems. And Windsor has a rich, uh, a, uh, a rich research group of um, different stretchable electronics and different stretchable polymers as well as fuel cells. And so our, our diffraction instruments will be able to really lend themselves to the different strengths that Windsor has. Our neutron imaging. So this is something that's largely desired by the Canadian nuclear laboratories who are helping design this instrument. And this stems from nuclear forensics. So from 50, 60 years ago, you dig up a, a flask, you don't know what's inside it. The labeling, the, the regulations um, back then weren't the same. How do we know what's inside this material or this vessel without opening it? Well, neutron imaging is an excellent way to do this. We have an excellent forensics program here at Windsor that would largely benefit from um, having access to these, these cutting edge and non-traditional strategies um, that can be applied to forensics. Archaeology, again, non-destructive uh, techniques to look inside of materials. Our boron neutron capture therapy. And so this is a, a very powerful, highly targeted technique. And the way it works is you inject the patient with a boron 10. So the isotope boron 10 um, with some sort of tumor targeting agent. And so the boron will build up inside the cancerous cells of the tumor. Now, when boron 10 interacts with a thermal neutron, what's produced is an alpha particle and a lithium particle. Well, both of these particles, the alpha and the lithium, impart all of their energy over a very, very short distance. In fact, when it's produced, it, all that energy is imparted onto the cell that it's produced in. And so thus it, it kills the cancer from within. And so this is what makes it so um, so powerful. If you can get that boron 10 agent to the tumor, you have very, very targeted and specific um, cell death leaving the surrounding cells uh, intact. So the CANS prototype for medical isotope production. So like I said, the uh, Windsor Hospital has a, a PET scanner, which you would use the uh, isotope 18 of fluorine. And the most common agent used is FDG. But fluorine has an issue. It has a half-life of about 110 minutes. So that means you have 110 minutes to get your isotope into the patient before you've already lost half of it. So currently we rely on our supply from two hours up the, uh, up the 401 from Windsor, two hours. So just the act of getting the, the agent to the hospital, you've already lost half your material. And right now this, this is working. Um, at seven, roughly 700 patients a year, um, this, you, can, you can schedule in such a way that this works. But with the provincial government approving more and more types of cancer uh, for PET scanning, the patient load has the potential to, to increase um, significantly. And if we get to a point where uh, the current model isn't sustainable for an increased patient load, something has to change. And so um, producing, producing these isotopes locally is, is highly desirable. But it's not just, we got to look at the big picture. It's not just uh, a prototype we're building. 
and bringing in a new cancer treatment to Canada. But we can further develop the technology, the target moderator technology, make it better, build larger facilities. Our prototype could be just one of a series in a network across Canada of these compact accelerator neutron sources. Each CANS, because they're modular, each CANS is able to do the science that it best suits the location uh, that it resides. So the one in Windsor may look very different, say, than the one in Halifax, if that time comes. And of course, when you start putting together these, uh, these types of facilities and networks, there needs to be national governance. And so there's not just a lot of physics work to be done, um, but a lot of science communication and science policy to be done as well. And with that, I'd like to acknowledge the, the postdoc and the, the PhD student who is working on this project. Um, the leadership team in terms of, of the design of the facility and, uh, and our funders and in-kind contributors to, to this project. And with that, I am happy to, to take questions on either front, whether it be neutrons or whether it be lipid flip-flop. All right, well, thank you, Drew. And if anyone has a question, uh, please use the raise hand feature. And then uh, when you're acknowledged, you can un unmute yourself and ask the question. Or if you don't wanna do that, you can put it into the chat. So there's a question in the chat, maybe you can just uh, read it and. A question. So why do the neutrons penetrate through the lead, but not the flower? Do they scatter differently? If so, why? Okay, so let's go back to this figure. So they go through the lead because lead to a neutron, it's not on this particular figure, but you can get the idea if you compare iron with x-rays to iron with a neutron. You can see that its cross-section is very small, which means that the neutron is has a lower probability of interacting with um, the nucleus of, of a lead um, compared to, say, other elements. For example, hydrogen. And so what is a flower? Well, a flower is life. It's made up of cells, lipids. These lipids have hydrogen. So these flowers are highly hydrogenated, or in other words, lots of hydrogen is present. And so the neutron has a higher probability of interacting with those hydrogens than it does with, say, the lead. And so this is why it lights up. Now, the actual physics, um, why does it scatter differently? Well, there's a Nobel Prize waiting for somebody that can um, make those predictions. So right now, when we look at these, say, cr these cross sections, they're empirically determined. With, in other words, somebody has to go and measure them and then tabulate them in, uh, in different books. For example, I have my big little book of neutron data. And so it has all the, the values that I need. Um, but if you were able to come up with a theory that predicts this, you're highly likely a Nobel Prize in it for you. So I 100% encourage you to go and solve this problem. All right, uh, Steve. Yes, great talk, Drew. Thank you very much. I actually had a question on the same slide because I really want you to win that Nobel Prize. I'm uh, I'm putting all my I'm putting all my money on you right now. <laughs> um, so I guess you can't answer it, but literally one of my questions was just on the slide: Is there a simple way I can understand why the cross section for hydrogen is like twice as big for deuterium when the nucleus of deuterium is twice as big as the nucleus of hydrogen when you said they interact with the nucleus? It seems so counterintuitive. Is there just forget the 
big explanation. Is there a simple explanation for that? It's uncharged. The nucleus of deuterium is roughly twice the size. It's two, two nucleons, hydrogen's one nucleon. How can it be more likely to interact with the proton? I don't get it. I, I, I don't have a good, I'm uh, sorry, Steve. I, I really don't have a, a good answer for you because I, and I blazed over this. There's not just a cross-section difference, but this little purple dot in the center, this implies that there's actually a phase shift and so what happens with hydrogen in this case is a compound nucleus is formed and then the neutron goes off. And so there's the, the phase shift in the, in the scattered neutron from hydrogen, deuterium and many other elements, most other elements don't form this compound nucleus. Now that doesn't actually explain the large cross section other than the fact um, there might be a, a, an added favorability for the neutron to interact with the proton because it forms this, um, this temporary uh, proton-neutron complex. But beyond that, um, it's, it's, it's unpredictable. Oh, okay. okay. As, as, far um, as, as far as I know. Now, I haven't dug deep into trying to predict it because the... Uh, um, in all practicality, you go to, to the, the tabulated values of cross sections anyways. So can I, can I ask, is this data for thermal neutrons? And does it hold true for all neutrons? Because I guess if what you're saying, if it's for thermal neutrons, it, it could then be that, that the slow neutron is more likely to form some kind of metastable, to interact, to scatter. It has to form a metastable interaction with the proton. Whereas with the deuteron, it would have to be some kind of three body, right? It forms a metastable thing with three different nucleons, which might be unfavorable. So that could maybe roughly explain it. And so the way we, so when we do these experiments, we're, we're using thermal to, to cold. And so we've, we've tried to slow them down, okay. but, but yes, that these, these values are, are um, energy dependent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, mean, I, I have a question. Um, so I don't see anybody's hand up. Um, and yeah, that maybe I can make a comment to this statement about why these things are, are, are large. You usually see quite a bit of, of hand waving with respect to, you know, it has to do with resonance with respect to possible nuclear bound states, right? And for some cases, it seems like this is a sensible answer, but then you still have to know, well, how do we know the energy levels of each nucleus, right? Which is still an incredibly hard problem. Um, Right, so my question was about this, um, the uh, Windsor Center for Neutron Research. So some, something simple like a, uh, just a diffraction, neutron static, inela sorry, neutron elastic diffraction experiment would be well within the, the reach of something like this? Yes, yeah. Yes. Um, so what we would be aiming in performance is, uh, similar to what a, a medium-sized uh, reactor historically would, um, would yield, at least for the, the SANS instrument, the diffraction instrument. Uh, okay. Any, is there any hope for anything inelastic? At the, at the price tag and um, energies that we're going to be able to work with at a prototype level, so, you know, on the order of, of $10 million, the flux is pretty low for a time of flight um, okay. instrument. However, this is why it's a, a prototype and one could envision a future in Canada where there's a central facility that houses one of these $100 million um, uh, pieces of equipment. And now that you would be aiming to, to gain enough flux in order to do a, an inelastic experiment. Okay, but these, these, this design, um, I don't remember what particularly you called it, but this design, and it's just, you can scale it up to that size. It's just the one that you're planning on is, um, given the, the funding constraints is, is, sm is too small. Yeah, yeah, to the okay. funding constraints and, and you have to prove the technology um, before 
going bigger because in order to get those fluxes, you'll be increasing the, the proton energy. Um, and you do that, the, the, the safety surrounding it, the activation of materials, everything kind of goes up. And so we need to get it right small before we go big. Okay. But it's, it's, that's a, I know this is where largely where your interest would lie. And it's also, it's too bad because the Nobel prize in physics in 94 to Brockhaus was for his work in inelastic. And so that's, that's something that other than the triple as axis at McMaster's nuclear reactor, that's all the capabilities we have for inelastic right now. Well, it's a start. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Any other questions? I'm seeing. I have, I have, I have one uh, there, Jeff. Okay. Let's let let's let uh, Drew talk about his science a little bit. So, Drew, if you go back to slide five, maybe I have a simple question. Two simple questions about your actual research, which is very, very cool. Slide. So, one is a uh, biological question. I think this is probably simple. Uh, mm, yes. Is there a simple way for me to, as a non-biophysicist to understand what the difference between a donor and acceptor lipid is? Yeah. So um, I didn't go into to detail on the, on the prep, but we can run through it. Now's so your the, chance. Yeah. So the, the way we generate the, the asymmetry is what we have is a a population of donors, donor lipids. So this donor lipid is the lipid that you want on the outer leaflet of your, of your vesicle at the end. And so they're MLVs. So that means they're multilamellar vesicles. So that you can think of them as onion structures where each layer of the onion is a bilayer itself. Okay. And so that's our donor lipid. And when you incubate it with a a shuttling molecule like methyl beta cyclodextrin, which is a, a sugar macrocycle that can help shield the, the hydrophobic chains of the lipid. When you mix it with your acceptor vesicles, and so the acceptor is what you want on the inner leaflet. Okay. The outer leaflet of your acceptor will exchange with the donor material. And what you're left with are these asymmetric systems where you have donor lipid on the outside an acceptor lipid on the inside. And then you have to go through various cleaning procedures to get rid of the cyclodextrin and the, the waste donor until you're left with your, your um, asymmetric vesicle. Okay. But, but the, 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 the terminology for donor and acceptor refers to what you want on the outer leaflet and what you want on the inner leaflet. Okay. And then if you just go ahead to slide 12, I just have one more question, experimental question as an experimental physicist. So um, approximately like one of those curves, like curve A, uh, can you give us some idea of how long does it take to accumulate the data from one of those curves? And what was the energy of the neutrons in that experiment? <laughs> okay, so it takes about to get, um, this type of data, so this, this gives us a, a, a fairly high degree of structural resolution. It takes about an hour per, per curve. Per curve, okay. Now to answer your energy question, this was done at Oak Ridge. And so um, it, it's a time of flight, it's a spallation source. And so what happens is your proton hits the mercury target and that's time zero. And then I'll, a wide range of neutron energies are released. And because we're working with an elastic um, setup, each neutron is counted when it hits your detector and a timestamp is given to it. Okay. And so instead of using a single energy, we use quite, um, we use a broader um, energy spread. So we use lots of energies in order to compensate for the fact that it's pulsed versus a steady state like a reactor. And so there's no single, um, single energy. The, uh, the wavelength spread, uh, I'd have to go back to the paper. I wanna say it was on the order of 10% um, 
But to put that into perspective, this data, each one of these curves took three minutes. And this was at a different instrument. And what we did here is we actually took out any of the energy selectors. And so what that does is it gives us a 40% 40 40 wavelength spread or energy spread for the neutron, but it completely wipes out any um, structural information. We have no structural resolution. All we see is contrast. But by doing that, we increase the uh, or decrease the collection time, which allows us to, to look at faster kinetics. Okay, that makes sense. By the way, on this slide, that contrast matching idea was brilliant. I'm, I'm glad you gave credit to the people who came up with that. That's a brilliant idea. It's I would have so I would have loved to to been the one to do that, but no, yeah. it was Nakano in 2007. Yeah, but what a great idea! That's when you see it, it seems so obvious, but that's just a brilliant idea. So love that. All right, I am not seeing any further questions, so. Let's thank Drew again and uh, call it a day. Well, thank you very much.